Okay, now we are online, everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to TLTN's research seminars. And today we are very happy and excited to have um, Dr. James Cochran from University of York at, in Toronto um, talking, share, sharing with us uh, about a topic which is critical plurilingualism in an age of Anglophone hegemony, focusing especially on um, the hegemony of the English language uh, in publication of research uh, articles. And um, James Corcoran is an assistant professor of ESR and applied linguistics in the Department of Literatures, Languages and Linguistics at York University. And uh, he teaches uh, TESOL certificate and uh, ESL undergrad programs, and uh, James has published work in uh, very prestigious journals, journals, written communication, Journal of EAP, English for Academic Purposes, Inter International Journal of English as a Lingua Franca, among others. And uh, he has recently published two books with Valich entitled English for Research Publication Purposes. So this is ERPP, English for Research Publication Purposes. Uh, this is also a new, uh, a, a re relatively new area of research. So without further further delay, let's uh, let's turn to James. Okay, James, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Angel, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm I'm honored to to speak with this group today and and uh, it's exciting to be talking to a group that has had so many um, scholars that are working at the at the forefront of, of theorizing and today I would argue and and this presentation is very much oriented towards pedagogy and the sort of flow between pedagogizing and theorizing uh, when it comes to pluri orientation pluri oriented approaches right so today in this presentation i am and i'll start sharing my slides now i am not only going to talk about uh critical plurilingual pedagogies which was the the subheading of the the book that i published with my partner in crime karen englander um who can't be with us today but sends her regrets um so we have proposed a, a critical plurilingual approach to pedagogy aimed at supporting English language publication uh, for scholars who use English as an additional language. However, as the title may suggest, we're, we're suggesting a more pluri-oriented approach that not only considers the advanced literacy practice, uh, practices of plurilingual scholars in terms of their English language publication, but how they balance their, their advanced biliteracies or pluriliteracies. So we'll talk about it as a pedagogical approach today, and we'll suggest some of the underpinnings of that pedagogical approach, um, both empirical and theoretical. And then we'll talk about um, critical plurilingualism as an interpretive lens, right? So rather than just a pedagogical approach, a way of sort of um, understanding the, the processes and the practices and the, the beliefs of plurilingual scholars who are operating in this, this market of knowledge production. All right, I was going to um, uh, shamelessly promote the graduate program at York University, and uh, now I have done it. So there is the, the information for the grad program at York. Just to note, it is, as you can see behind me, um, the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Linguistics. And um, we have a wonderful grad program there with uh, faculty that teach in not only applied linguistics, but also uh, linguistics and social linguistics. So today we'll start out with some, uh, you know, I'll, I'll reflect on my own subjectivity, what I'm bringing to the table, where I come from, um, why I'm interested in this particular topic. We'll bandy about some of the terminology um, that I'm going to use today, which, as Angel referred to at the beginning, is sort of a new area 
a new area of research and a new area of pedagogy, uh, in fact. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of that terminology. I'll go on to discuss the, the knowledge economy and how those operating within this knowledge economy um, are dealing with the increasing pressures to publish work in index journals, which oftentimes means in, in English. Um, and, <clears throat> and the pedagogy that I'm going to describe today and the, the uh, theoretical lens is particularly well suited to understanding those pressures, how they're attended to by individuals, but also by institutions who are increasingly rated by their, their levels of production and their visible knowledge production, which again, essentially means research articles in uh, high impact journals. And again, increasingly up to 90% plus of those journals are in English. So uh, I'll then go on to talk about Mexico University where I carry, I've carried out a couple of case studies, talk about some of the findings and have that lead into a discussion of some of the recommendations for that university and what can be learned from those recommendations, including how it inspired this particular pedagogical approach that I will describe today. Then I'll then raise questions for researchers and for pedagogues and for policymakers, um, and then discuss the conceptual lens of critical plurilingualism and some of the intersections and divergences with between critical plurilingualism as I see it and translingualism. So again, just to just to situate this, just to situate myself in this work. So I am an Anglophone. Uh, I'm also a plurilingual uh, scholar, but I'm not the type of plurilingual scholar that I am describing uh, today in this work. Um, so I use plurilingual EAL to describe scholars who are using English as an additional language for publication purposes, right? Um, and uh, this new field that I'm describing today that where um, this work is located is English for research publication purposes, which if you think about English for specific purposes, right, it then branches down to um, English for occupational purposes and English for academic purposes. So I would say English for research publication purposes is aligned with English for academic purposes, right, but it's a more specific academic purpose. And um, Right. So what else should I say about myself? Well, um, I also want to talk about ideology. Um, I am introducing a pedagogical approach that is empirically driven, theoretically driven, but also ideologically driven. I'm very clear about my own ideology and my own um, feeling that there is a need to attend to uh, inequity. In, in terms of knowledge production and, um, and this approach and the lens uh, are, are specifically suited and oriented to attend to broader inequities. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from and I'll go into more detail on that. Um, MU is the pseudonym for the university where, where uh, much of my research took place. Um, and again, CP is critical plurilingualism, the conceptual lens and pedagogical approach, which draws on theory and research from these various areas like applied linguistics, sociology, education, and writing studies. Um, and the other distinction I make is between emerging and established scholars, right? So emerging scholars being those who uh, are either PhD students or new faculty and established scholars being uh, faculty researchers who have more experience, in particular with, with writing, writing for publication. Okay, so uh, this will be no surprise to those uh, in the room today and those following along with us that what used to be the adage of publish or perish has now become in many parts of the world across disciplines and across geolinguistic regions uh, publish in English or perish. And these pressures to, to publish research in English have grown and, and shifted 
with economic ideologies that, that sort of prize the globalization uh, of knowledge and in this so-called knowledge economy. And over the past decade, or I would say maybe decades, the, the burgeoning field of English for research publication purposes has documented individual responses to these pressures from scholars across, the, uh, across disciplines and across regions. Um, in this presentation, though, I discuss growing efforts, and I would say this is indicative of a shift in the field of ERPP. Um, and uh, John Swales talks about this, saying that, you know, there's, there's a real shift in the, in the field from a discussion of the problems and the inequities to a shift to describing solutions or, or ways of mitigating the challenges that, that global scholars are facing in what I describe as an asymmetrical or unequal uh, market of knowledge production. So I'll talk about uh, pedagogical programs and responses to these pressures uh, for researchers who use English as an additional language or plurilingual EALs. And, and uh, as I mentioned, it's called uh, critical plurilingual pedagogy. So before I describe the pedagogical approach, let me situate the work that I did in Mexico. So I was um, hired to be one of the instructors for a course, a three week intensive course. It was aimed at supporting mostly PhD students, but also their supervisors uh, with publishing their work uh, in English, which was a graduation requirement in the department, the graduate department of biology. And increasingly across regions and across disciplines, this is an, an expectation, is that there is some sort of publication um, in order to achieve uh, graduation. And if that publication is to be in an index journal, then oftentimes that means in English. So at this university, they were unhappy with their, their rate of visible knowledge production, unhappy with their graduation rates among their PhD students, that they were taking too long to be able to publish their work in, in these index journals. And so they decided one thing that they could do is offer a course and then they in order to put this course on, they drew from various knowledge bases. So there were, um, there were the curriculum developers were those who had um, expertise in the area of natural sciences. They were, um, and, and the rest of the instructors were scholars with applied language expertise and instructors with applied language expertise. So there were EAP instructors, and then there were broader folks with applied linguistics expertise and that was me and so i was on a team um, delivering this course and after i delivered it the first time my experience in the course was and this was anecdotal was these mexican scholars or latin american scholars because some of them were from different parts of latin america working at this mexican university and they described to me their frustrations with having to publish their work in english with having to balance their biliteracies, um, with the lack of pedagogical support for their writing at the institution. Um, and in general, um, their, their broad range of frustrations. And this, it had a serious impact on me. And I thought, well, you know, this is interesting because it wasn't all of them that felt that way, but maybe in investigating this course, that could be a window into better understanding the experiences of, of this range of scholars. Um, so that's what I did. And this became my, my doctoral work. Um, and uh, since carrying out the doctor, my doctoral work, which was oof, seven or eight years ago, I then uh, uh, carried up, out a follow-up study with, with uh, both emerging and established scholars. Um, so I'm going to briefly outline some of the findings from both of those case studies and uh, talk about why they're why that's important. So again, so, some may recognize the university from this photo. I uh, do not share the name of the university just for for maintaining uh, ethical protocol. Um, but it is one of the most prestigious and research intensive universities in Latin America. Um, with incredibly high levels of knowledge production. But that knowledge production, as you can see, the uh, difference between 
the uh, blue and orange lines there is the blue is total knowledge production. And that is in all languages. And the orange is visible knowledge production or that published in index journals, uh, which is almost exclusively in English, not completely, but almost exclusively in English. Um, and you can see the, the big gap there, right? So that's what concerned the university. That's what concerned the uh, graduate program in biology. And that's why they put on this particular course. Now, the course itself was divided into three areas in three weeks. Um, and the it, it spanned these areas, principles of academic publishing, so how to navigate submission and review, uh, how to consider impact factor, how to identify an appropriate topic or audience or readership, an inappropriate journal, how to write effective abstracts and cover letters. Next, and this is the genre focus, is scientific article, um, understanding style and structure. So what are the structural components of a research article? What are the rhetorical moves that uh, are carried out in each section of an article, right? Taking the IMRAD model, right? Introduction methods, um, results and discussion, um, how to create effective figures, tables and graphs, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, you get down to the last category, which is sort of the focus on, on lexical grammar, right? So identifying, parts of speech, word order, verb tense and aspect, these basic things that you would expect to see in a language course, right? So um, in that sense, uh, there are, it was, it was very much broken down into different types of instruction. And that's where the different areas of expertise from instructors were, were handy. And I should note that in the principle of ap academic publishing, there was a visit, uh, a Q&A session from a journal editor from uh, one of the journals in, in the field of the students, right? So uh, this course was delivered many times, uh, in particular, one that I looked at, uh, let's take an example, veterinary science was the, the students were from veterinary science and the journal editor was from that area, right? And that was one of the most popular uh, aspects of this course. So here are some other details, right? Incredibly intensive, these, these scholars ate and slept and, and breathed their research articles. So they came to the course with a working article that was meant to be publishable by the end of the, of the three weeks. Um, and they received feedback during the course. Um, they, there were lectures, workshops, individual analysis, consultation with instructors, et cetera. And like I said, a visit from an editor from the discipline. So the questions that I had going into this work, again, using this case of the course as the broader case, and then the multiple cases of those, the two subgroups, right? Emerging and established scholars who were taking the course. I wanted to better understand their experiences with writing for publication. So what were their attitudes towards English? What were their challenges achieving publication in English? And what impact did they perceive the course to have uh, in mitigating those challenges? And then, you know, that perhaps as important is the follow up work, which five years later asks them to reflect on. So, what did you take away from taking that course? Now that we're five years down the road, has anything changed for you in terms of your beliefs, in terms of your processes and practices, et cetera? So, here's some of the findings um, from the 2013 work. So, when I say that this is a hegemonic uh, landscape where English is the dominant language. It most certainly is, but that is not to say that publication doesn't happen in other languages. It certainly does. And these scholars balance their, their advanced literacy practices and they publish in both English and Spanish. Um, but when I ask them why, uh, English is, uh, they receive remuneration from the institution. They receive uh, remuneration from National Science Council um for uh achieving publication in english they can get uh they can advance academically in their national system of evaluation um, for phd students they could get hired as a faculty member there are many reasons why they choose english as the in the first position 
over Spanish, including international recognition, um, status, uh, etc. But they also use Spanish um, for a variety of purposes, including national grant applications, um, engaging with their data, right? Uh, data analysis, um, ease of expression when they felt like the burden of English was too heavy, uh, and also perhaps most importantly, and this brings up one of the one of the most interesting um, areas of tension which is that they want to disseminate their research to a regional audience or a national audience and English is not going to connect with that audience. So you end up with this disconnect between um, them wanting to, to solve national or regional problems, which is, that's what we're doing in applied work, right? Um, yet, uh, if they publish their work in English for an international audience, that's not necessarily going to connect to that regional or, or national audience that they want to um, to help understand uh, or solve particular problems. One of the other emerging uh, findings from this work was the, uh, and, and in this work I interviewed uh, the PhD students, I interviewed the um, faculty supervisors, I interviewed the course instructors, and I also interviewed the guest uh, editors who came to um, to speak at the course. And one of the interesting notes was their competing and different perceptions of fairness in scientific knowledge production. So when I talked to many of the, the scholars, they said, you know, there is bias at journals against my English, against my name. Um, that this adjudication is not based on scientific rigor um, and that no efforts are being made to change this unequal, inequitable situation. Whereas the, the editors, who by the way were all Anglophone, uh, L1, um, they suggested that the scientists' English is prejudging their, their success rather than anything systemic. Um, but the systemic issue that they pointed to was their lack of human resources that can create occasional inequality that they had to reject a high number of, of articles because uh, they just didn't have the ability to um, provide pedagogical type feedback that could um, help guide uh, the publication uh, well from submission to publication. And they also suggest that individual and group efforts were being made to change uh, an occasionally unequal, inequitable situation. So again, you had different um, uh, varying what, what I would call ideologies of English and science that, that uh, underpinned these different perspectives, but that was one of the interesting findings too. So here are the rest of the findings from both my work and uh, Karen and, uh, and her team's work uh, in Mexico and Karen, uh, along with David Hanauer and, and Cheryl Sheridan, identified a quantifiable burden of writing research in an additional language. So not just anecdotal, not just qualitative, but a quantitative burden of writing in English as an additional language for, for research purposes. And adding on to that are the, the qualitative findings, right? So scientists write in multiple languages inspired by multiple reasons, including primarily institutional and national systems of evaluation that promote indexed publications. Um, and these Latin American Spanish L1 scientists face specific challenges when writing science in English, uh, which I can get more into later. But, uh, um, and then again, what I, what I identified these, these sort of varying perspectives of scholars versus editors and, and reviewers, right? So sort of both sides of, of that, um, of that coin, right? So the gatekeepers had very different perspectives than, than the authors. Um, and that there, and the findings from using this, uh, this workshop as a lens to understanding um, the, the experiences of these scholars is great, but there also appear to be clear short and longer term impacts on emerging and established scholars. So, you know, for emerging scholars, the clear, the clear impact was a broad improved genre awareness, 
right? So awareness of the expectations for writing a research article. Um, and for established scholars, the, the clearest impact was an enhanced ability to navigate submission and review. So to, to deal with feedback from editors, to deal with feedback from reviewers, which all of us who have gone through this, this laborious process of, of uh, trying to get work published, know that that can be one of the most challenging um, uh, things to deal with. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the interesting findings, which is rather recent, um, is that uh, scientists engage, and again, it's probably no surprise to this group that scientists engage in plurilingual knowledge production practices, even when the final product is in English. There is, um, there is work happening in Spanish, when Spanish is their L1, they are doing, they are creating outlines in Spanish. They are making notes from reading uh, in Spanish. They are, um, they are putting chunks of text into their manuscripts in Spanish and then translating uh, or, or then editing, right? All of these practices are, are part of their practices that are um, obscured. Right or occluded when you look at that at that final product, right, which is in English, um, but they need to be attended to, and that's part of what this this approach will will uh, suggest today. Right. So some recommendations that stem from this work. Um, so it's to increase this type of offering uh, across disciplines, and indeed that did happen at this university. Um, it's one of the only universities I've seen where this happened and it happened over the span of a decade. And the, this scientific writing for publication was offered across disciplines, uh, both in discipline specific, uh, manner and a more discipline broad manner where it brought together sort of, uh, a range of social scientists into the, into the classroom and other times very specific, right? Um, uh, next, the recommendation is to take a more critical plurilingual approach to pedagogy that views language as resource rather than problem. And, and that's what I'll expand upon today. Next uh, suggestion, and again, these are dealing with systemic issues, right, is to make vetted translation and editing services readily available to scholars, right? So rather than villainizing this type of, uh, this type of, um, practice that is common among those balancing these biliteracies, right? Using a translator. We have, we create these networks, right? And effective scholars have these networks that they, that they depend on and that they utilize and they mobilize resources and utilize them. Yet uh, in this particular context, that's very much behind the scenes and it's secret, right? Um, no one wants to talk about it. Uh, next, uh, increase the number of bilingual scholarly journals at the university and increase participation of scholars with these journals as uh, acting in these um, roles that allow them to be gatekeepers as well, which can enhance ability to, to uh, create and edit work as an author, right? If you are reviewing work as a, review, uh, you know, as a reviewer, if you're involved in these editorial practices, it can help you as an author. And I found that personally uh, is the case uh, for me as well. Finally, and, and this is a much bigger issue, and this is what many have suggested is including, uh, for example, Ken Highland recently um, suggested, like this is the only, and, and Mary Jane Curry and, and Teresa Lillis uh, in their work, um, at the level of policy, is the way that we can uh, we can engender change, right, to the largest extent. So institutional policies need to explicitly value to a greater extent this plurilingual production, right? So if not, then you're going to see the same shift, right, towards from balancing languages for knowledge production to English becoming primary dominant and sometimes the only language of knowledge production for for scholars which i argue is a bad thing for the world uh, uh because as we know 
language being a meaning making tool and an and avenue for understanding the world. Uh, if we if we if it becomes more unitary and it becomes uh, more more anglicized only, then that carries with it particular epistemologies and part uh, particular ontologies, which is not good for science and not good for for scholars and perpetuates inequity. So what do we learn from from that research and how can it be applied to pedagogy? Right, so adopting a, a plurilingual orientation, right? So this field of English for research publication purposes, whether uh, it's intentional or not, and I would argue that sometimes it is intentional, it takes a limited and a limiting monolingual orientation towards plurilingual scholars research writing, often taking a deficit perspective, right? Focusing on their shortcomings, right? Well, they can't do this well, they can't do that well, so they need to be supported in this, that, and the other way as they seek to achieve the pinnacle, the, uh, the ideal, which is publication of their work in English, right? Um, and this type of monolingual focus and monolingual orientation by, by not just pedagogues, but also researchers, uh, potentially contributes to the reification of these unequal relations of power and the hegemony of English in, uh, in scientific knowledge production and academic knowledge production more broadly. So what can an approach, a pedagogical approach that tries to counter that, uh, that hegemony look like? Well, again, just, and I'm very briefly going to draw upon this wide range of literature, as you can see, is drawing upon literature from these uh, varying uh, uh, specific areas, right? So critical EAP or critical uh, ESP, um, plurilingualism and pluriliteracies, right? Social practices of writing, uh, genre studies, um, critical applied linguistics or critical educational linguistics, um, L2 writing, uh, translingual writing and uh, epistemologies of the global south, right? So it's drawing on, on a lot of this work. And even though it's called critical plurilingual pedagogies, I want to give particular credit to, to Nigel Harward and Greg Hadley's work on, on critical pragmatism, because that's really the umbrella under which this approach lies, right? And, and in that way, that's one of the distinctions I would make to between this and a, and a, a purely translingual approach, or um, is that, this recognizes the need for scholars to balance these pluriliteracies, right? It, it's not simply saying this is completely ideological and we need to counter this hegemony. And that means anti-English, anti-imperialist. Well, no, it, it's, it's balancing the reality that scholars need these, these literacy skills in order to succeed, right? And that's the pragmatic part and the critical part uh, coming together. So, you know, if you're looking at foundational elements of, of this pedagogy, right, is drawing on these on these three broad um, uh, tenets, right? So critical theory and pedagogy, um, plurilingualism, and identities. And, and note that I'm pluralizing that, right? And identities in terms of hybrid identities, evolving identities, as scholars um, identities shift, and, and they shift as their, their language proficiencies shift, as their, their knowledge production practices shift. Um, and again, that will be no surprise to those in this room. And highlighting some of the, the different orientations to ERPP, right? So on the left, you'll see a pragmatic orientations, which are often monolingual, at least implicitly monolingual. They're often individual, uh, thinking at the cognitive level, that classic literacy approach, or it's, it's, uh, it's all in my mind, um, directive, right? Um, apolitical, power and identity agnostic, right? Uninterested in those areas. Whereas a more critical orientation is plurilingual, either explicitly or implicitly. It considers social uh, practices, it's reflective, it's explicitly political, and it's power and identity interested. And the three sort of basic areas that are, that are promoted in this pedagogical approach are, and here's the pragmatic part, right? Genre awareness. It is absolutely essential that scholars are aware of the, of the intercultural differences 
in genre expectations between between texts, even if they're they're minor differences. Um, it's important that this awareness runs to not only research articles, but how research articles differ from other major genres that that are expected of researchers, right, and of those who are publishing at, at this highest level. The next level is critical language awareness, right? And this is where the, the focus on power comes in, right? And it's focused on th the fact that, number one, you need to be able to identify norms and dis discursive norms, uh, but you're also able to navigate your own voice um, and recognize um, your voice evolving as you attend to those norms. Right, so the critical language awareness understands it promotes an approach that understands that there are literacy brokers involved. This is not an individual endeavor to produce a research article. It is multiple people contributing to the production of this article. And I don't mean, I mean, even in a single authored article. Um, and I, it's interesting because I was watching one of the past episodes from this group where, where Jerry Wan Lee was, was describing, you know, like, this is a fallacy that that uh, exists. That this is an individual thing that happens in a, in a in um, a research article, right? That it's a totally. And I think he was describing Paul K. Matsuda. Um, but regardless, this critical language awareness understands that there's negotiation that happens with literacy brokers. There's negotiation that happens with gatekeepers. And again, I'm drawing on this terminology literacy broker and gatekeeper from uh, Mary Jane Curry and Teresa Lillis's work. Um, and so that critical language awareness understands that power is located in particular places, that this needs to be negotiated, that voice needs to be negotiated, um, but it also inspires, and this hopefully it inspires um, agency among scholars, right? So it goes, it also, when talking about critical language awareness, it can go as far as understanding language policy and one's individual and collective rights uh, in terms of um, following or challenging policy at the institutional level, at the, uh, uh, at the national level, whatever the case may be. And finally, sustainable writing practices, right? So this type of pedagogy doesn't just hope that, okay, well, if Pedro shows up to the, to the course, he's gonna, we're gonna get his article from the point where it is to publishable. No, we want Pedro to be able to go away from the course with the ability to not just publish that piece, but to become a better editor of his own work, to be better able to marshal the resources necessary for um, and, and establish the networks that are necessary for uh, in order to do this over time and time and time again, right? Because it doesn't stop, right? Those of us who who are part of this system we're expected to constantly publish, right? Um, and that's and that's a problem, but it's a reality. Um, so providing scholars with sustainable writing practices is essential. And um, here we go with the with the curricular tier, and this is borrowed from uh, you know building on the great Angel Lin's work here. The you can see on the left column the identify and replicate. Right, so this is a, a very pragmatic genre based approach that says identify the norms and replicate them, identify rhetorical and stylistic norms and replicate them, identify lexical grammatical elements of writing and replicate it. Right, um, whereas on the right side, the identify and situate is historically and and socially situate these norms right and suggest that they're dynamic. They have shifted over time. Scientific writing has not is is not monolithic. It has not been stable through time. It has shifted over time, and it shifts for a multitude of reasons, right? And if we compare and contrast, there are ways that we can stretch these genre expectations. These discursive norms are flexible, right? And so, ideally, we help scholars enact their agency and allow them to decide how they're going to challenge and push these boundaries, right? Um, or whether maybe they're just going to replicate, right? Um, 
So this type of approach recognizes and validates intelligibility over accuracy of expression um, as its benchmark. Um, and it, um, it encourages scholars to reflect on the impact of their language choices, right? If I'm choosing to publish in English, what are the ramifications of that choice, right? Am I not going to be able to connect with a particular audience? How is it going to impact me, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and as I mentioned before, critically reflect on agency and navigating those power relations between authors, brokers, and gatekeepers. And finally, there's a focus on discursive and non-discursive features. And I'm taking those terms from Suresh Kanagaraja's work and whereas discursive meaning textual, right? And non-discursive meaning extra textual, anything outside the text, right? So non-discursive feature is, for example, if we're thinking about um, uh, unequal relations of power and asymmetrical relations, it's that at a center-based university, like York University where I am in Toronto, I can go and get writing support at the writing center by those who have expertise in advanced research writing. I have access to, to networks. Um, I have these things that are not necessarily available, right? I have access to research um, uh, labs. I have access to scholarship. I have access to library uh, databases. All of these things are non-discursive um, uh, resources that are sometimes unavailable to international scholars, right, and have to be attended to. So uh, what does critical plurilingual pedagogies look like? Well, here's just one sort of activity that you can do right at the beginning of the course, right? So it is just a set of statements and you could do a Likert scale response. So ask your students if you were doing this electronically. Okay, so uh, from strongly disagree to strongly agree, I'd like you to respond to these statements. English is the best or most natural or logical language of science. To get published in English, the manuscript must be perfect uh, language-wise. Publish or perish is the only or the best way to evaluate scholarship. And reviewers and editors are never biased or discriminatory. And scientific rigor is the only criteria for acceptance. And if you interrogate these and, and look at the, the, the research, um, none of these are true, right? Um, English has not always been the language of science there you know even a hundred years ago english had the same level as german french and russian um, in terms of language of science and if you go further back english takes a, a, a more secondary role right and it won't necessarily always be the main language of science either um, and language of a manuscript does not need to be perfect native speakers make mistakes all over the place i just got a manuscript back a few weeks ago and the reviewer uh, pointed out uh, so many <laughs> uh, lexical grammatical issues that it was borderline embarrassing. But, you know, this is that's the reality, right? But if it doesn't impact intelligibility, um, then uh, that's what the, uh, the editorial process is for, part of what, what it accomplishes. So it's often a misconception among international scholars or plurilingual EALs that their English has to be perfect in order to get their work published. Um, finally, then the publisher parish, right, is, uh, is allowing scholars to reflect on this, right, and reflect on how this has changed over time. And when you ask experienced scholars, established scholars about the publisher parish maxim, they oftentimes reflect, and some of the scholars I talked to at, at Mexico University reflected and said, this has really changed in the 30 years that I've been an academic, right? And it really started to shift about 20 years ago, and then 10 years ago is when we saw these systemic shift, and now the new reality upon us is that we, we have to publish, or we will not be able to um, stay in this field or uh, ascend in this field. And finally, reviewers and editors are never biased. This is completely untrue, although there is still dispute uh, about this, this fact. And some, one of the questions today that I got from um, someone in this group was, is there a difference between those that understand 
these politics of language. And so like someone from applied linguistics, are they more open to uh, a range of Englishes? Are they more open to these sort of um, discursive variation? There's no evidence to suggest that's the case. In fact, sometimes uh, they're harder on, on authors, if anything. And the same goes for if you have someone who's categorizing these, these categories are ridiculously problematic, but a non-native English speaker as part of an editorial board or as a reviewer, there's evidence to suggest that they are, if anything, less uh, welcoming of this variation than, than the, the classic native speaker of English. So um, interesting to consider. Uh, again, so here's questions that we can ask ourselves, right? And I'm looking, at, I'm looking in the mirror when asking this, but also at all of you. So how do your research adjudication practices promote or challenge discursive conventions or normative conventions? Um, how do your research support practices? Uh, oh, that, that is the same. Oh, right. So how do your adjudication practices do that? How do your support practices do that? Your pedagogical practices? And how do your adjudication and support practices um, promote or challenge normative ways of doing and knowing? So again, some questions that, that arise from this work, right? So how much genre focus should be sacrificed in the name of critical instruction? Um, how can instructors balance the need for immediate insistence in lieu of sustained writing practices and processes, right? So this goes to that issue of uh, sustainable uh, writing practices and that being one of the, the necessary elements, but sometimes that gets thrown to the side because someone needs to publish and these students need to graduate. So we need to take that piece that they're working on and make it publishable. Um, how can we get funding for these types of interventions that that I'm critiquing here, um, but also that are there's a clear ethical imperative for these types of interventions at, at research intensive universities uh, around uh, the globe. Um, however, I want to highlight that Karen and I are not suggesting a one size fits all approach. It needs to be grounded in local realities. It needs to be grounded in local uh, historical and, and social context. Um, I guess on that note, so, you know, the, this question coming from uh, Ryuko, uh, like how can critical plurilingual lenses and pedagogies be employed in a way that recognizes the pitfalls of approaches that claim to be plurilingual, but then tend to become superficial, celebratory and non-performative, right? So they end up just being critical in name or plurilingual in name um, rather than in practice and how they're carried out. And next, the question for researchers, right? So who should be carrying out research into plurilingual scholars working outside these centers of knowledge production? Should it only be, and this has been a trend uh, in, this, in this field, although it's not the only people doing it, but um, who should be carrying out research? Who should be delivering instruction? Should it always be those from the global north and those from Anglophone centers of knowledge production uh, going elsewhere to bring light to the darkness, you know, uh, especially with uh, in, in this north south type of way. So suggestions for ERP researchers, right, adopt a more plurilingual orientation to our work, where we mindfully include focuses on language other than English, right. So I, I find this tension in my work where I want to highlight that, you know, English is the hegemonic dominant language. However, there is work being published in a multitude of languages all over the world and by, by plurilingual scholars. So that shouldn't be ignored uh, either. And when they're producing their work, they're drawing on their diverse linguistic repertoires, right? Which isn't necessarily reflected in these final products, um, but needs to be the focus of research, right? Um, next to embrace and promote diversity and plurality of research writing and support, widen our lens to understand the longer term development of scholars advanced literacy practices and finally reflect on our how our research and pedagogical orientations uh, maintain our challenges maintain our challenge unequal relations of power 
between individuals and groups. Right, so I realize I'm coming to the end of my time, but I'm just going to go over a few pressing questions for pedagogy, right? So who's ideally suited to deliver these type of courses? Should this delivery be discipline broad or discipline specific? Should delivery be aimed at only PhD students, for example, or should it be a combined emerging and established scholars? And I would argue there's there's some evidence for both being potentially effective. Um, how can institutions develop models that are context specific and responsive to scholars needs and desires um, rather than just taking an entire approach, a uh, lock, stock and barrel? Uh, what accompanying institutional supports should be in place, right? Ongoing writing support in multiple languages, promotion of these biliteracy skills or pluriliteracies, translation services, research and writing mentorships. All of these things are doable and are done, but in a, in a scattered and uneven manner. Uh, policy questions, right? Are there levers that are, are policy levers the best ways for institutions to change the publish in English or parish reality that most scholars face? And many would, would argue that they are. Um, and many would also recognize that they are the least flexible. Um, but one of the other questions I received in advance of this presentation from the group was, what can those of us who are in these positions of, of uh, these administrative positions do to impact this reality? Right. And so one of the things that can be done is advocating for a shift to recognize um, the uh, publication of work in multiple languages and to not have this disparity. For example, at this Mexican university where I did work, English language publications, depending on the discipline, would receive anywhere between three and 10 times as many points on the point scale. Uh, as would Spanish language publications, right? And I've, and I've heard similar things from different parts of the world. Um, uh, what's the role of national funding councils in impacting knowledge dissemination? So if scientists are, are um, encouraged to publish in particular language in order to get funding, that's what they're going to do. They need that funding. So again, that's a, that's a really important lever. Um, how might associations or publications accommodate plurilingual knowledge production, right? So journals providing abstracts in multiple languages, regional, re, regional publications going fully bilingual instead of just abstracts. Um, how can faculties and departments and scholars push for changes? And finally, if we're shifting to now thinking about pedagogy to thinking about um, interpretive lens, Right. So um, adopting a wider angled critical plurilingual lens, I, I would argue, you know, that's what I'm trying to do in my work is shift from a more monolingual to plurilingual gaze, um, focusing on the experiences of plurilingual scientists as they draw upon their language repertoires that naturally shift across time, space and context depending on their biographies, their lived experiences, their social tra trajectories and life paths, right? As um, Steve Marshall and Danielle Moore suggest. So I argue that adopting this type of descriptive, heteroglossic, sociolinguistically in inspired lens may afford a better understanding of the complex beliefs and practices of plurilingual EALs as they navigate agency within a knowledge economy that values English language onto epistemologies. Again, borrowing this wonderful term from uh, Sunny Lau and Saskia Van Vegan. So finally, the research and theory questions. So what more can we learn about pluriliteracy practices at the cognitive and the social level by adopting this type of lens? Um, how can empirical work lead to greater theorization of how plurilingual scholars develop access and utilize their, their repertoires when producing these written products, even when those products end up being um, at least externally viewed as, as in only one language. Um, and what do evolving pluri-oriented, like translingual and transsemiotic theories, have to offer to those engaged in plurilingual scholarly production um, and those who are engaged in the support and adjudication of plurilingual scholars' work? 
All right, so I'm going to leave it there and leave you with this visual of this conceptual lens. And I will note that I am still thinking on this topic and still sort of pedagogizing and theorizing, um, you know, and driven. Everything I do is driven by classroom practice. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, James. Um, you have laid out a roadmap for another hundred years of work. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to summarize um, all that you have laid out, all those questions uh, at the macro level, at the micro level, and at the psychic level. Um, Saskia, Sami, Qinghua, and myself are working on a book project called Decolonizing Peace Law. And we're using this macro, micro, psychic level framework. And I'm trying to summarize what you have mentioned. Um, you're trying to move us away from this deficit lens to this um, asset-based lens. So at the macro level, institutional policy advocacy level, policy level in terms of all the pedagogy, all the uh, setting up resources, and also the tenure and promotion porn system, macro policy level, a lot of work needs to happen there. And the micro level, you mentioned the gatekeepers, the editors, the literacy brokers, in their microaggressions of multilingual, plurilingual writers, there's a lot of microaggressions targeted against, especially what you mentioned, the so-called, the, the non-native speaking reviewers and editors are the most harsh ones a lot of the times. Um, and that brings my, my summary to the psychic level. The desire for colonial English embodied in these editors, reviewers, who themselves are so-called post-colonials. And I saw them, and I argued with them. I even scolded them in editorial meetings. I said, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you finding fault with this plurilingual writer's um, lexical grammatical <laughs> errors? So things, so what I find missing from your model but it's not really missing. It's actually, I would complement it with post-colonial subjectivity theory, at the theory at the level of desire. So these people will say to you, sorry, I can't accept your manuscript. It's full of mistakes. Find a proofreader. So we, we, we are faced with all these microaggressions. From people who are so called post colonials, who are non native English speakers, who are kind of like the master slave. Okay, I am slave number one. I speak most, mostly like my master's standard model. Now I am monitoring these other slaves. Anyway, I got emotional a little bit because it's lived experiences, it's all these microaggressions that. All of us have had psychological scars navigating the space. Um, and we need post-colonial subjectivity theory at the level of desire, the psychic level. So, okay, so I have piggyback on your on your wonderful presentation to say that we need to attend to the desire, to the colonial desire. And we need to de imperialize the desires of these gatekeepers and also uh, these in institutional policymakers. A lot of the times they are post colonials themselves, but they have colonial desires for maintaining the porn system for publishing in English. So, and why I get emotional? Because I have been subjected to microaggressions and I have witnessed microaggressions targeted at the so-called non-native non-native writers at all levels macro micro psychic level okay so i pick it back back on your wonderful presentation now i like to hand over the speaking turn to 
Pedro to ask questions. Pedro, over to you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good. Thank you, Dr. Corcoran, for the, uh, the presentation. It was it was very good to to learn from you. One more time. I I actually had that question that you, you mentioned about if editors that come from the area of language studies, if they are if they are more aware of the the, the challenges of uh, plurilingual scholars who who try to to publish in English or attempting to to break the barriers in in, in their places. So um, I think I would like you to. to to comment a little bit on that in terms of how does this uh, cr critical uh, plurilingual gaze can uh, orient them and then can can help uh, the area to move on right because i when when this type of behavior happens i, I believe that it, it it stops the flow of the area right so so many people with so many good ideas that could publish and then they are uh they they are uh forbidden right for um, from publishing so i'd like you to to comment a little bit more on that please yeah thank uh thanks for that uh question and the comment so rather than just give my perspective i can tell you the perspective and the experiences of the scholars that i researched and some of their feedback on their experiences of navigating submission and review or that they would receive feedback such as, and raise your hand if you have received this before, um, please check your English and resubmit, right? Or please have your manuscript read by a native speaker and resubmit, right? So right there. Um, so there are things that are at the systemic level and there are things that are at the individual level, right? Which need to be addressed. And these are things that do not need to be addressed by the authors themselves, right? Which is the point that I'd like to make here is that we can do things at, at the pedagogical level that can impact scholars and their ability to, and, and we can affirm their evolving plurilingual identities and, and, and plurilingual practices. But unless those who are responsible for adjudication of grants, those who are responsible for adjudication of research articles, make shifts in the way that they attend to these, to this discursive variation, to this, um, and I'm not just talking about Englishes, I'm talking about ways of storytelling, right? Because what else are we doing in research other than just telling stories, right? And if we're, and if we're telling the story, and, and this is, where sometimes I have hope and sometimes um, I have more frustration than hope is that I don't see a lot of critical reflection by those who are in, who are in position in gatekeeper positions, right? And in order for there to be change, yes, we need to affect change at the policy level, but there also needs to be a shift in the way that we engage with these texts as reviewers and as editors and um, some of those shifts should be a promotion of intelligibility over accuracy, right? And um, those of us that have worked with, with uh, graduate students um, in, will recognize that there are a range of, um, of issues with advanced textual production, right? So sometimes language really is an impediment to intelligibility, right? But there are other times, and I'm talking about style now, where stylistic features overlap with lexical grammatical issues, and all of it is lumped together in the same category as language problem, right? And that's because we have our own ideologies uh, of English, our own ideologies of research and of science, that guide the way that we interact with these texts. And until there's a recognition on the part of gatekeepers, then I don't know how much can change, right? And so that's why 
um, in one of the pieces I shared with you, I, I purposefully posed questions at the end that were not for pedagogues. They were questions for um, journal editors and journal reviewers because they hold the key, right? Those of us who are involved in journals, uh, academic citizenship is really stretched, you know, like we're all so busy. And, and if we had the actual time to put towards these pieces and take a pedagogical type of approach to feedback there, then uh, we would all be the better for it. Right. And Pedro, to answer your question more specifically, the scholars I talked to often talked about how they would submit something, but the feedback was so rude or so harsh that they would just put it on the shelf and then it would go there to rot. You know, it would never see the light of day. Right. And how is that good for science? Right. That's not good for science. Right. That, that, that's <laughs> decidedly bad for science, right, if, yeah. if that happens. So the one thing that we can do as pedagogues is um, provide plurilingual scholars with, and this goes for all scholars, but provide scholars with the ability to have a thick skin, to be able to um, synthesize feedback and identify feedback that is meaningful versus that which is again, as I'm talking about style here, that is that is sort of um, delivered with uh, underlying ideologies of how, how a paper should be structured, right? And so I'm happy to take feedback from reviewers, but as I become more experienced as a scholar, I recognize that I'm allowed to talk back. I'm allowed to say, no, um, I'm willing to do A, B, and C, but I am not willing to do D, and here's why. And that's a huge step. And you'll recognize in most courses that, that uh, support scholars' research writing, there's no discussion of that. There's only a discussion of identify the right way to do it and copy that way. And if you don't copy that correctly, then you're doing it wrong. Rather than here's how you might differ from this norm, right? And here's how you can navigate your voice as you're, you know, um, getting used to these conventions, as you are um, diverging from those conventions, perhaps, right? Uh, so, yes, it's a problem. It's an issue. And I, I find hope in that I've seen this pedagogical approach have particular effects, right? And I've seen uptake among scholars and I've seen a light go on and even with experienced scholars who say, wow, I never thought about the fact that I could say, no, I'm not going to make that change. Um, right. As long as you give a rationale and any editor who is worth anything will recognize that. Right. And say, okay, well, um, that's, that's their decision. Right. I'm trying to balance the, the suggestions provided by reviewers with the scholarly voice of the author, right? And they're the one that did the research. They're the one that did the work and the writing. So um, let's balance those things. And again, um, getting to Angel's point about the sort of post-colonial subjectivity and the, I don't want to call it the self-hate, but the, the, the prejudice of those who use English as an additional language, but are also in positions of uh, authority and gatekeeping positions, there is some evidence to suggest that, um, you know, and, and not just anecdotal evidence, that they're even harder on those who are, uh, are writing with the same linguistic resources they have or are writing in other Englishes, right? So it's because they have invested so much time and energy in this capital and now they've gained it and they don't want this to lose currency so they That's are right. the most steadfast yeah. upholders of this kind of capital linguistic cultural capital because they are kind of like slave number one and they have spent all their lives to be to climb the ladder to become slave number one they're looking at slave number 23 you have to climb the same ladder as me i'm slave number one now okay this kind of uh, psychology is very real 
among the so-called post-colonials. Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I, I hesitate to use uh, uh, the slave uh, number uh, analogy, but it is... You, 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 you cannot, I can, because right. I'm post-colonial. And I've met so many slave number one, two, three. <laughs> they're talking to me especially back in hong kong they're talking to me with this colonial voice they're more colonial than the british colonials these are chinese hong kong people okay not all of them i have to rush to say but they are more colonial than the british <laughs> mm -hmm. can it be linked to meritocracy can it be linked with yeah yeah, yeah i have i have spent all my life mastering the master's language, which is BBC English. Now you say you can just come along and speak a, a world Englishes, Asian Englishes, or Hong Kong Englishes, and then you can reach the same points as me. How dare you do that? This kind of psychology, but they don't know that they 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 are actually remaining at the slave strata. Okay, although they it's... call themselves as number one. <laughs> It's, it's, it's also, I was thinking about this now, and then it's probably keeping face, like that person has their name attached to a, a publication, that, and that is the person who reveals the publication. So probably they will think, well, I don't want people to read this paper that I approved, uh, and then think, well, this person ended up approving this paper for publication. So I think it's a very complex issue. Uh, so, you know, you know what about all these uh, uh, complications, right? You know what's interesting on that front is that different disciplines have different ways of reviewing. So in our area, we're used to double-blind review, right? So we don't know the identity of those who review our work unless they want to be known, right? And unless the editor agrees that they're allowed to be known. There is some evidence to suggest that feedback practices shift when the name is attached to them. And I think personally that it would be better if we were open and said, hey, I'm the one reviewing your work. Here's what I have to say. Now attend to it instead of just hiding behind my words, right? And um, yeah. there's a connection to sort of social media there and, and the way that anonymity allows for uh, a lot more vitriol. And, you know, I think uh, Brian Paltridge um, has done some interesting work in this area, right, looking at feedback practices, right? And that's an interesting thing to note, is that nobody teaches us how to get, I mean, we're all in the area of education, right, language education, we all understand how to provide feedback, but nobody teaches you how to provide editorial feedback, or how to provide feedback as a reviewer. There yeah. is no class on that. Right. And oftentimes that's what will dissuade someone from moving forward with their work is the the harsh feedback that they will get. Right. And that can it can damage someone at the individual level of that research. It can also damage them at the career level. Right. And that's why, you know, one of the things that I advocate for are graduate students getting involved with uh, mentorship style journals, right, where they can have a mentored process where everything is visible, right? There's nothing invisible happening here, right? There is a, and I had this experience at um, the Canadian Journal for New Scholars in Education, I think was the name of the journal. And I was editor of, of that journal. And I was also able to oversee the shepherding of an article all the way from submission right and sometimes the piece was not even close to publishable but over time with various levels of feedback between reviewer who were more more experienced scholars the reviewers they provided feedback and that pedagogical process can be career altering for for a scholar you know because it can it can provide confidence, it can provide ability to attend to feedback, which oftentimes is one of the most difficult parts of, of reaching publication. I can say that even now, you know, I still struggle sometimes with getting uh, harsh feedback, right? And looking in the mirror, I have to catch myself sometimes in providing particular forms of feedback and reflect on, is this your ideologies at play here? You know, is this just 
your stylistic preference instead of something that really needs to be changed here, right? Yeah. And I have to catch myself sometimes from, from giving that type of feedback, both in my, well, do I say this? Yeah, in, in my course feedback, as well as when I'm providing feedback as a reviewer. I suppose, I know nobody wants to be a reviewer these days. I suppose journal, journals, they are making so much money, ripping us off, so pay the reviewers, number one. I mean, we're all doing volunteering work, but then they are ripping us off. They're charging the libraries so much money for the journals. Number two, if they pay the reviewers, they need they should require the reviewers to take a course, online course. Okay, <laughs> maybe decide by James and your colleagues. An no, it's, a, course. it's yeah. actually a reasonable idea, right? Even yeah. even a even a three hour yeah. course. Yeah, with, online with course. That. Yeah, to like how to give courteous feedback which is respectful yeah okay. now, I, I have an idea now we have to collaborate all of us on a Lovely. critical plurilingual feedback course yeah and we should say no to those journals who just capitalize on our voluntary work to make money for these incorporations right like springer rollage <laughs> Well, um, we provide content. We are the content creators, and they 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 rip us off. They charge the libraries and everybody for how much how much money per article, right? So now, um, I'd like to hand over to um Bungi, Dr. Bungi Song, our postdoc research fellow here for for questions. Thanks, James. Your work is so wonderful. That gets us so animated, and excited. <laughs> Well, as, as we are criticizing publishers, I just wanted to highlight these two books from one of those publishers. I know. We are, in, we are complicit, right? And the, the, reality, the reality is that when it comes to the, the, the systemic issues um, and the systemic rewards for publishing with these types of uh, uh, publishing houses, instead of open access, lower uh, lower prestige uh, publishing venues is, you know, one of the things, the, the re there's a reason why we make those choices, right? And we don't have the ability to make different choices until we have some sort of job security. Yeah, collusion with resistance, I always use this. And also we, I noticed there is this open humanities press uh, based in Duke University which is an alternative, at least to the humanities, to the cultural theories, the publication, very good publications, open access. Uh, so, so there is hope, there is hope among a lot of the difficulties. Yes, Dr. Song, Bongi. Okay, just um, let me just try to, um, I have, I'm just going through a lot of thoughts and emotions. I was one of the things that I was listening to is um, when I was working as a, right after my PhD completion, I had been working as a um, liaison for business faculty and then involved in their program innovation and support for um, almost the department itself has um, has almost 25% of students body in undergraduate program are international students. So there is a pressing need for the program to respond to this growing population. And so, but one of the things that constantly come out is that the, the the majority of the administrators are from a monolingual or anglophone background that ha have very little um, exposure to plurilingual pedagogies and um, they all, and inevitably they've been looking at the students from a deficit perspective so your promotion about the per, like shifting our focus to critical plurilingualism does speak a lot in but at the same time i'm constantly thinking how can can this be pitched to those administrators and program leaders and so forth who has has um embodied the this hegemony english monolingual english language ideology and seen this is the the way to go and and then when it comes down to plurilingual uh, critical plurilingual and approaches then the response is all, 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 almost always it's too expensive it's labor intensive um it takes a lot of effort to do so 
Well, if they fix their grammar, then the problem will be get solved. How can the person who is um, is like me, if it's a very um, minority woman, can problematize or pitch to those who are more elderly or who are more established, who are have a lot of experience in admin. My old men. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> to to persuade this, you know, this is I think it's not just my own problem, but I think this is gonna be continuous power struggles and so i just want to hear some of your insight on this thank you uh thank you uh, fantastic question i wish i had an easy answer for you um you know all i can speak to is experience and highlight context again right in that whatever shifts we're looking to make um, and whatever changes we're looking to make in terms of challenging inequity need to be done uh, within an understanding of the, the, the local context, right? So when you describe, you know, having to convince a business faculty of the need to take a more uh, identity affirming uh, approach, uh, an approach that, uh, that values language uh, difference and language as assets. Um, I'd say making that argument is the challenges are different depending on where you're making that argument, right? So making that argument in my university in Toronto, where there's we're in a we're in a, a city that reflects super diversity, um, where that is the norm, right? Where that type of linguistic and cultural diversity is the norm. We see it reflected in our student population. Um, you know, where 50% of our students are uh, using uh, English as an additional language or could be categorized as those, even though the term is problematic of Gen 1.5, right? So they, they're, they're relative newcomers to, to Canada. Um, there's a big difference between that and then uh, convincing a business faculty where 90 8% of the scholars and faculty are using English as an additional language, right? And again, language is not the only entry point here, right? And, lang and you know, for those who talk about linguistic injustice, right, it needs to be a complex um, argument because language cannot be the only thing that is attended to, right? So long story short, especially in a business faculty, you have to make the financial argument, right? That there is something to be gained here, right? And that's what part of my research is trying to do is trying to give some, some credibility to this type of pedagogical offering and suggest here are some empirical findings that suggest that outcomes have improved for scholars, right? And what does that mean? It means publications, right? So those need to be tracked those need to be systematically tracked over time. Um, so I was unable to do that uh, as effectively as I would have liked um, with the, the course that I was involved with because I was not responsible for developing it and delivering it. Um, but if I were, then I would absolutely keep track of that and keep track of how of the, the you know, you're never going to show the direct uh, correlation or at the direct causation, right? But you can suggest uh, at least a small level of correlation between policy or pedagogy that promotes plurilingual identities and practices um, and the products that come from that, right? And so if you're in a business faculty, you need to show that those products are happening and they're happening even with this approach and you know what, um, there is both quantitative and qualitative evidence to suggest that this can be impactful, right? And for those of us in this room, probably many of us are paradigmatically aligned to qual in, in our approaches uh, to research, but there is a big argument to be made that we need that quan data 
to, to convince the bean counters, to convince those who hold the financial purse strings at institutions. Yes, we are preaching to the choir in this room, and uh, you're totally correct. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Phoebe, your turn to ask James questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm impressed by your framework and also the critical lenses. Uh, my question will be, uh, because you mentioned a lot about the values of putting forward some pro-lingual uh, critical perspective and also uh, use pedagogies to support science writers. So my uh, question would be, how would multimodal resources and also artificial intelligence may contribute to uh, the scaffolding process or the dialogic feedback process if we want to install some design application or even cor corpus space uh, repertoires with more uh, counter-pro-lingual voices in future in uh, some publishing, writing, or uh, training courses for postgraduate students or emerging researcher. What would you think about this area? Yeah, great, uh, great points and, and great question. So on, on the corpus front, you know, that, that has to be an active part of pedagogy, right? And one thing that, that uh, corpora can accomplish, right, apart, I'm not a proponent of basing all pedagogy around corpus analysis. Um, and because I find that to be a, again, a more power agnostic type of approach. Um, but one thing that can be highlighted when looking at a range of publications, and you can do this even having students. So one of the first things I do with scholars when I'm working in this type of classroom is I ask them to compile their own corpus. So I ask them to go to the leading journals where they want to get published. Number one, identify three journals where you want to get published eventually, even if you don't believe you're good enough right now to be published there. From those journals, choose two articles, and then they choose those articles. Identify some rhetorical moves in these articles that are common across the board. Identify some um, features of these articles that are common, right? And these are chunks of language that can be identified across these different articles, right? And that can provide these scholars with um, uh, resources that they can put in their toolbox, right? And then draw upon. That's not plagiarism. That's smart writing, right? Being able to identify language chunks that achieve particular rhetorical moves, right? So, you know, um, much research has shown, oh, present perfect, has shown that that, 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 that has been found in this area, semicolon. However, much more research is needed in A, B, and C area. This paper fills the gap by doing that, you know, so that sort of creating a research space and identifying, right, that, that taking a corpus approach will allow um, students to identify those moves done across a wider range of papers, right? Okay. So next, using identifying that corpus will also identify that there are differences in how scholars who have different linguistic and cultural backgrounds make those moves. And they're all successful. You know why we know they're successful? It's published, right? So um, there, there are also corpora out there that are specifically by those by non-native uh, English speakers, right? And there's an identification and a recognition. And this is not only from ELF, you know, but it's a, it's a broader recognition that scholars who use English as an additional language are successfully publishing their work and using these discursive, this discursive variation, right? And if we can convince scholars that that's taking place and that they're allowed to do that, then that can inspire confidence and ability to adopt that. On the topic of AI, there are huge, there's huge potential, and this is coming mostly from translation studies, is that um, whereas 10 years ago, even using, using Google Translate was a joke. I mean, I would look at my, my scholars that I worked with and I would say, oh boy, like I can tell that you just copy pasted this from, from Google Translate and it is not effective, right? 
these days you can use something like deep l and you'll you'll find that the translation it's not perfect mm. it doesn't attend to disciplinary understanding mm. but it's fairly good yeah you know? and it can be a starting point yeah right so then if we're creating sustainable strategies for publication mm. that's a strategy right yeah. identifying useful translation tools identifying use useful editing tools those are strategies right so if those are technological resources great if they're human resources great there needs to be a combination of those things in order to be effective right and it's the responsibility of those who are providing that support to make students aware of the of that potential um I see a future in which there will be even even better AI tools available to those looking to maintain these pluri uh, pluriliterate uh, production practices, right? But there will never be, um, you know, there's always going to be the human element, right? So there's a human on the other end reviewing your work. That human is in, has their own ideologies of language that human has been impacted by as as Betcher and Trowler suggest their their disciplinary communities right who have their own ways of doing things and ways of understanding things um so that that won't change but there is a lot of potential in in AI and Corbin and I don't think that's going to replace folks like us that need to be there to to support students but they most certainly should be um, taken advantage of by by uh, pedagogues and those uh, administrators who are providing different um, levels of support for scholars. Mm -hmm. Bungi, you were raising your hand just now. Did yeah, you? sorry, Bungi. Yeah. Go ahead. So I just I just cannot avoid not thinking about Jay Lanky's cementing map and cementing patterning because. Um, um, in one of the um, angels um, earlier um, plenaries that I watched before, she um, gave us an example of a international student who has a very nice rhetorical move. She has an introduction, body, and conclusion. That person has um, the rhetorical structure of first, da 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 da, second da 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 da, and third da 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 da, but the paper was being criticized by the teacher and then Angel has um, pointed out the importance of the cementing map and um, I'm, I'm seeing this um, quite a lot with um, this disjuncture between um, like IELTS type of um, pedagogy where um, styles and grammars and, and then rhetorical moves are, are, are compartmentalized and being taught separately. But I wonder, but I found that Jay Lanky's discussion on the semantic map shows that it's not about the language per se, but it's how the person organized the ideas and, and then moved to the next ideas and so forth. It's not the person knows the rules, but the person has difficulty combining the ideas into language. And so um, she gave us a really nice vivid example on this. And then I wonder whether this can be incorporated to, so for example, like critical plurilingual pedagogies and um, or corpus based pedagogy. Um, because um, yeah. Before yeah, before you answer Bonki, I want to raise Sir Real Cup, Kubota, Kubota and Joel. They have an article about uh, Real Cup employing this uh, PhD student as his proofreader, this native speaker, Joel, and real card non-native writer. But then they were entering into this conversation when uh, Joel, this native speaker, proofreader, copy editor, uh, was changing the sentences of real Cox writing. But then it's also changing the meanings of real Cox writing. So, so um, sometimes, as you said, the genetic pool of diversity, semantic diversity, ways of meaning making that you mentioned earlier. That is, it might sound style, style, in terms of style, it may sound odd to the native speaker gaze or years, and yet it is an 
alternative way of describing reality is a semantic diversity. So, so I just want to add to Bongi's uh, Bongi's question. This um, this article by Rilke and Jarrell. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm familiar with that piece by by uh, Joel and Ryuko, and and I know Joel Joel well, um, and I'm a fan of his work and Ryuko's as well. Um, it is interesting, isn't it? How how those these approaches to writing and our own sort of ideologies impact the way that we engage with text, right? And I think simply recognizing that that happens and that this is a collaborative uh, way of constructing knowledge is important. And as soon as you realize that, right, as the author, then you realize that part of your meaning making here is structuring an argument in a way that will be taken up by others in a particular way, right? So. Um, there's no, I think there are, there are ways, and again, it has to be driven by context, right? So what is, what is the language proficiency level of the students you're working with? Um, are they experienced graduate students who are, you know, all but dissertation level and who are working on publishing work in order to graduate? Are they established scholars who have a lot of disciplinary knowledge and understand these moves, but maybe their language proficiency is the thing that's holding them back, right? Maybe it's their uh, ability to navigate the, the interaction with reviewers that's holding them back, right? All of these are potential um, barriers, right, to, to achieving publication to sustainable uh, production um, on the part of scholars. So there are many entry points and I wouldn't suggest that there's just a one way to, to do things. And I like that idea of the semantic mapping. And, um, I particularly like it because it promotes it's affirming, right. And it can promote a recognition of one's own, um, style and one's own production practices and encourage reflection on that. Right, which is what's missing for for most scholars, and I don't. I'm not just talking about plurilingual EALs here. I'm talking about uh, research writers in general. Is there's an assumption out there, and I would say there there's a difference between language intensive type of uh, disciplines and those disciplines that think that they are not language intensive, <laughs> right? Um, and they just think the science will carry me. Right. As long as I'm doing, as long as I'm doing the science, right, that will carry me. I will get this work published. Right. Um, but if we can convince scholars from engineering, scholars from math, scholars from physics, scholars from all of these areas that think that there is this separation between language and content, right? If we can help scholars understand that these things are inextricably linked, that you can't communicate uh, the impact of the work you're doing without language, right? Like language is the the way that they were doing this, right? Um, I think sometimes that's missing, and uh, I would say that's one of the jobs of the the instructor or the the instructors is to promote that critical self reflection. Right. And whether that's through a combination of corpus uh, uh, based uh, pedagogy, whether it's through uh, critical discourse analysis of, you know, a, a single piece, whether it's through um, an individualized corpus and identifying one's own patterns. Right. So not just in one piece, but for those of us who have produced multiple pieces for publication, right? How many of you have gone back and looked at your own work and looked at how you write and how you make arguments, right? Your rhetorical patterns, are they always the same? Are they effective? 
if you go back and look at them, right? How can I identify how this can be improved? And again, I'm speaking to the mirror right now because I need to do this. <laughs> preaching to, do to this the choir. Yeah. Preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to add to your critical language awareness and expand it to critical social semiotic, critical meaning making awareness, because uh, in a lot of different disciplines, um, those conventions of using the diagrams, the visuals are also very discipline specific. And, and each, each um, resource, multimodal resource has its affordances and constraints. And all these are, are implicit pieces of knowledge of the practitioner in the discipline that they need to be made explicit. But in applied linguistics, as the term supposes, we are very local centric in corpus linguistics, applied linguistics, genre theories, myself included, I have been very local centric, meaning focusing on the linguistic uh, uh, resource, uh, whereas critical language awareness and critical semiotic, critical social semiotic awareness or critical meaning making awareness, um, which will help um, the writers, the editors, right? Um, I'm aware of the time. And last but not least, Qinghua, your question. I just uh, I'll jump in. Oh, uh, yeah, James, yes. For your question, I, I, it's a great point, right? And, and maybe this will answer the, the previous question better, too. That there needs to be a recognition on the part of those providing this support that, and this is where the combination of those with disciplinary knowledge and those with applied language expertise is the ideal combination, right? Oh, and, and those with local lingua cultural uh, expertise as well, right? So if you can find that combination, which the hats on one person is really hard to find, right? Yeah. But if you can find some combination of, of, of that in providing this type of support, that's ideal, right? Yeah. And that I mean, yeah, I'm increasingly seeing my identity as a, as not an applied linguist, but an applied social semiotic scholar. <laughs> because a linguist is very local centric. Yeah. But uh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> but those who have that that content knowledge, right, or that disciplinary knowledge can identify that, yeah, you know what, uh, figures, uh, creating an effective figure is yeah. usually the first go-to point of those who read this exactly. type of piece. Exactly, right? yeah. It's much more important, for example, in the field of mechanical engineering, yeah. or in, in fact, many types of engineering. It's yeah. problem solution. We don't, the, the rhetorical moves are different. Right. Exactly. And the ways that the, the semiotic tools are different. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So I could see tons of uh, PhD thesis that need to be done in the next, in the next century. <laughs> well, across, across disciplines. Yeah. Sorry, across right. disciplines. Yes. Tsinghua, so, last but not least. Go ahead. Tsinghua. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, um, it's a very, Personally, it's a very timely uh, seminar for me because I am right in the middle of replying to reviewers' feedback. I've been doing it for a few days as well. And of course, as everybody have experienced, I've experienced some significant challenges uh, to um, the core of my paper, uh, sometimes resulting in a way that I feel like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to address the concerns unless I may have to rewrite the whole thing. So there's a constantly getting, I mean, having, having this kind of uh, feeling and emotion that, uh, that builds up in me. Um, and also, um, I, I don't know why, but the reviewers can all of a sudden identify, okay, this is a novice uh, researcher, writer, and saying that and say things like that. Okay, so you are not supposed to use this research methodology uh, because it will be very difficult. Okay, things like that. So yeah, I think it's very difficult for me to, um, like after reading this uh, comments, it's very difficult for me to navigate a way, way out of it. I mean, navigate a way, a strategy that I can be dealing with it. So um, my question would be um, like when you when you meet uh, the reviewers' feedback, it, it is constructive feedback in a sense. But however, it's like it, it sounds like it's 
it's almost making the revision work to sounds a bit impossible. So my question would be,、uh, is there any holistic way or strategy、uh, that we can apply in in finishing this process, this reviewing process? Well, in in that way, I will defer to my more experienced colleagues、um, who do work in this area, and you know,、uh, folks like、uh, Brian Paltridge and Sue Starfield have a great book on navigating submission and review. I think it's a 2016、uh, paperback,、um, easily accessible. That I would suggest to all emerging scholars.、Um, uh, Mary Jane Curry and Teresa Lillis have a great.、Uh, Uh, book 2013 title that also addresses those type of things because it is emotive, right? And there's no way to separate the the emotion from from the writing. One, a couple of strategies that are,、um, and you know, I don't always follow my own advice here, but some <laughs> some of the strategies are number one, take some time between when you receive and when you respond. Number two, remember that there is always a journal out there that will publish your work, and that the feedback that you're getting from real people who have taken some of their valuable time to give you feedback should be taken seriously, and you should see that as a way to improve your work. Right. On the other side of of the same coin, you should also be ready to throw away particular feedback that you don't think helps move your piece forward, or that goes against,、um, I guess, the the essence of what you're trying to say, or who you are, or both of those things, right? So, in that way. That's part of our that's part of our evolution, right? As emerging scholars, is to、right. learn how to navigate these these challenging waters, right? Because、um, academics are not always nice to each other. That's、uh, that's part of the culture. It's a problematic part of the culture,、um, and so sometimes. The, and, and this is one thing that I try to to express to to scientists I work with too is sometimes you move on, sometimes you you take that advice that you get, you take the feedback you get, and if you don't think it's going to work out, maybe the editor is not helping, right?、Um, and this is the job of an editor, and editors aren't always good at this.、Uh, sometimes they defer too much to the reviewer,、mm. including to negative reviews. Yes.、Um, So sometimes you have to just say, "Thank you, I'm going to go elsewhere," and you take that feedback and you help. It helps improve the piece, and you go to another publication. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, that's that's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's, not, it's not going to end your career. It's not going to matter whether you get published in Tissel Quarterly or Journal of, of English for Academic Purposes or Critical Inquiry and Language Studies, and that you know that. The 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 name of the publication is not going to make or break your career, right? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it's just a matter of luck. Who your reviewers so that、uh, randomly, right? Same yeah. thing with a with a grant, right? You know, yes, <laughs> you don't get to choose who reviews your work. Exactly. Yes,、uh, thank you very much for the suggestion to to reflect on this process because、I've, it's also a learning process for me. So to reflect on this process, I feel that I, I can I can really appreciate the the time and efforts that's put in to read my work and and provide feedback.、Uh, I feel like what is most hurting is like、um, in the manuscript if there's something that is not making sense to the reviewer, then they turn to assume、uh, the worst. Cause,、uh, for example, if I go out of the convention and use another term, I have a purpose of doing that. But instead of saying the purpose that is there, they assume that okay, so you didn't even read、uh, blah blah theory, so that's not there. So you know, I I can respond to this feedback, and I can also respond to this feedback in a very. Uh, in a very polite way, but it's always a, a processing here. Like、uh, you choose, you you choose this、uh, methodology because it's easier. So I always feel that、uh, to be assumed the worst is the the worst part of this process. Yeah, like, it hurts. Yes,、because、it hurts. Because we operate with this deficit model. 
they don't think you have something really useful. That's why you are using an alternative term. They assume that you haven't read so and so's a deficit model. Yeah. Well, it's also it, it's also a lack of recognition of intercultural rhetorical differences, right? And uh, so, uh, for example, when I work with Spanish L1 scholars, to yes. use the same term over and over for all other Latinate languages, and I'm talking French, Spanish, Portuguese, whichever scholars I'm working with, they think it's ridiculously elementary, that it is, you sound like a child if you yeah. use the same term over and over, well, whereas in English, that's the expectation. If yeah. you don't do that, then something is wrong, right? So That's why, James, I think uh, we should design a course for reviewer. And uh, I will recommend journal editors to impose this, even though we are, it's difficult to find reviewers. Still, we, we cannot just use anyone as a reviewer because they can do a lot of hurt. Well, uh, Xinhua, the, the, the other thing to remember is that um, the reviewers don't always give their full attention to a piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we are so, in, everyone is so incredibly busy <laughs> that sometimes I spend a lot of time on a piece mm. and, I take very, and I pay very careful attention to the feedback. And other times, there's a quick turnaround needed and I only focus on the things that I can focus on in the time that I have. And maybe I didn't give my full attention to something. And you know who knows their work best? You. Mm -hmm. yep. You're the one who knows your work best, right? So you need to advocate for yourself when you give feedback, right? What's the worst that can happen if you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. The worst that happens is the reviewer says, I don't think this has been attended to fully enough. Could you please revise and resubmit? Okay. Right? In which case, you just go through another round, right? Mm -hmm. Or then you say, okay, no, sorry, I'm going somewhere else. Yeah, so with that, I'd like to have a last round of um, not questions, but just um, say something and then we need to finish off because I know it's been uh, almost two hours. But it's wonderful discussion. So I'll start with Pedro and then Baby, Bongi, and Qinghua. Yeah. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Corcoran, for for the lecture. I think that my takeout was your uh, reconceptualization uh, of uh, critical pragmatism that includes uh, genre awareness, critical language awareness and sustainable writing practices. I, I found that very interesting. It resonates with many of the uh, the works that we have been seeing. And I I hope that we can break the the, the cycle, like when, when Xinhua becomes an editor. <laughs> I'm so harsh with the reviews that he made because yeah. now he knows that this is not the way that we learn, right? So uh, the, the publish and perish uh, cycle has to be broken, right? Yeah. So this is my my take from your from your your lessons. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, Bungi. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that I have is very much emotionally laden for me. In, in this um, today's talk, it wasn't necessarily about the theory or practice per se, but um, the so I was um, able to somehow connect some of ide ideas about the colonial subjectivity and colonial subject, and how it's this empowers one's um, ability to speak, and what we together was questioning is the individuality and and um and then separation and isolations and the idea of perfection we are countering that kind of discourse to be collective and collaborative emotionally supportive and that was kind of the feeling that i'm getting from the today's discussion that we are not alone and we have to support each other and we are advocating each other we are instead of looking at 
finger pointing at the individuals instead of problematizing individuals, but we are looking at what other people have and then highlighting that and in a together sense. So um, to me, it, that is kind of what brings to me in my mind is the humanity and the ethics and morality to, 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 the, um, to today's discussion. And I really appreciate the feelings that I'm getting right now. Thank you. Wow, that's very important. The ethics of research publication, it opens up a new avenue for research. The ethics of research. Publication. To build on that, that's a, I mean, wonderful sentiment, but it also highlights how social these writing practices are, right? This is not an individual endeavor. Yeah, um, it's the more collective you can make it and the more your network can grow and that can go as far that can even be emotional support network right yeah. so it doesn't just have to be those who are in your small subdisciplinary area or your little niche of research who can support your writing it can be uh friends colleagues yeah and the, the ethics of self self care uh, this is a less attended to area in research publishing that is self care how to preserve your well being yeah it is a very challenging and very harsh process that we are mm -hmm. mm. hey, you know it's not it's not hard to understand why we don't hear more about that because those who would perform such self care probably are no longer in the profession because they are not torturing themselves Exactly. In the publisher parish cycle. Yeah. yeah, I have actually friends who are like that, who quitted academia altogether. And and that's a loss, as James, you said, that's a loss to epistemological diversity and our knowledge knowledges. Yeah, and Phoebe, yeah. Yeah, thank you for today's wonderful seminar. Uh, from your conceptual framework about um, today's pedagogy, I, I have learned a lot about how to situate ourselves as EAL or ESL writers, uh, because uh, you mentioned a lot about subjectivity and also we talk a lot about well-being, emotive uh, concern. And from your sharing, I would uh, imagine that for L2 writing or my doctoral research pathway to support public relations writing, uh, we, we need to try to uh, echo the values of create social semiotic resources and the community support. And also I uh, appreciate your mentioning about we are not uh, repeating or copying uh, from our, you know, um, target subjects or the disciplinary practice, we are creating new resources and new knowledge and with our own patterns and our own agency. And that's what I learned from you and also from all the researchers here. And thank you so much for today. Thank you, and Chengwa. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, the presentation today. I really feel like I've learned a lot through this process. It's no matter your uh, framework and the research that you've done and also the kind uh, experience that you shared. And I think this seminar will be of great help to many of our viewers on YouTube as well. So yeah, I'm sure that they are going to benefit from it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And then also thanks to those uh, people watching us on YouTube. And uh, and uh, also um, please refer to James's articles you know, in the description under the um, the thumbnail. You can find James's articles. And um, uh, the TLTS seminars uh, will resume uh, in December. And uh, we will have more seminars um upcoming so pay attention to and then press subscribe and press the little bell icon and then you will get reminders and give us a like right but again we want to um thank james because you opened up the whole century of research work you you lay out the roadmap and which is urgent both urgent and and important and I feel like so many emerging scholars or scholars struggling in in their solitude, in their own little chamber, and feeling hurt, feeling am I am I am I not so 
am I so bad in my writing? But your work is so important in helping us to regain our voice and find our voice. So, um, so thanks for laying out this roadmap and all this pioneering work. Once again, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for the invitation. And uh, it was wonderful chatting with you today. And uh, I look forward to more engagement. Thank you, everybody. So tune in to our channel for more seminars in December and also next year. And um, thank you again, James, <laughs> and our, our host. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>